All right, in this last video for this section, we're gonna look at equations involving absolute values. So we've seen absolute values, but not so much in a larger equation format. Um, but when we solve, we solve, and we actually just need to make sure that we set it equal to two answers or two equations. So think back to absolute values. For instance, right, the absolute value of five is five, and the absolute value of negative five is also five, right? It's a distance from zero. So what happens is two different values, five or negative five, give you that same result. So when we solve absolute value equations, you're gonna see that we're gonna set it to two different versions so that we can get both of those possibilities. Now to do this, you do need to make sure that the absolute value is isolated first. Okay, so before we start, you do wanna make sure your absolute value is isolated. This one is, so we can jump right in here. Okay. So I'm gonna have two versions. So the inside stays the same. And then I set equal to 11, and then I do the inside the same, and then I set equal to negative 11. And that's gonna give me my two possible answers here. And now we're gonna solve. So I'm solving here and I get my two different answers. I'm just going to make sure I always check my work um, before I keep going. Um, so that looks good. And these, again, you can check. You don't have to check these. You don't have to worry about extraneous solutions or anything here. Um, but if you want, it's always a good habit to check. So what's gonna happen when you plug in that seven first. So here I'm checking seven. You get absolute value of 14 minus three. And then absolute value of pods of 11 equals 11, which is true. When you check the other value, you have negative eight minus three. So you have absolute value of negative 11, which is also positive 11. So that's how you get the two answers. You're basically looking for the different signs on the inside the absolute value to give the same result in the end. Now, for example, 10 here, you can't start until you isolate the absolute value first. So here, we're gonna bring the 15 to the other side. And then I'm gonna go ahead and divide by five. So I wanna get the absolute value completely isolated first. Once it is, now I can split into my two parts. So one minus four X equals three and one minus four X equals negative three. Subtract one from both sides. Here, you're doing the same steps, but you're gonna get different answers. And then I divide by negative four and I have X equals negative one half here and X equals positive one here. And I'll let you guys try the check at home. Um, again, we're not worried about extraneous solutions here. So they should work out assuming you didn't make a mistake. Um, but the big thing here is that students always forget is they jump right in. You don't wanna set this equal to positive or negative 15. You need to isolate that absolute value totally first um, or set it equal to you know, just the zero. You wanna isolate that absolute value first and then split. Otherwise you're going to get the wrong answer. Um, so you wanna be careful there. Now, the other thing I wanna point out, I have one more example for you, is that in all cases, after you isolate, that value is positive. So notice here where my absolute value was set equal to number, it was positive. Here, when my absolute value was set equal to a number, it was positive. And that's really important. In the next example, you're gonna notice that when you start to solve and isolate that absolute value, you get that the absolute value is equal to negative three. Well, absolute values cannot be negative because they're, they're a distance to zero. So absolute values are never negative. They're either positive or sometimes zero. So if you see something like this where the absolute value is equal to a negative, this is a no solution. You do really wanna be careful though because you cannot make that conclusion until the absolute value is by itself. Now, if you look at the original problem, it looks like there's nothing wrong with it. 
Um, but once we get the absolute value of loan, now I see it's equal to a negative and I cannot do that problem. So we have an application, but in this last video, I just kind of want to recap the different styles. There's a lot in this section. Um, like I said, it's kind of a mishmash of a bunch of different equations that we just want to touch on, but that we really don't want to designate a whole chapter to for each one. So the first one we did here were the polynomial equations. So for your polynomial equations, basically the technique you're probably going to be using is factoring. So you're going to be factoring them, setting your factors equal to zero and solving that way. Um, you should check your answers here, but you don't have to worry about extraneous solutions. The second one we did was radicals. So you had a radical in the equation, right? And you wanted to clear that radical out. So in this case, you were getting the radical by itself and then raising both sides to a power. You do have to be careful here because that raising to a power idea creates extraneous solutions. So you do want to check your answers for radical problems. Rational exponents are really also just radical problems. It's just a different way to write them. So they're very similar in structure where you want to isolate the rational exponent first, and then you have to check for extraneous solutions. Uh, one thing that makes these a little bit more challenging is that you do have to be careful about that top value. Um, if that top value is even, you are going to add a plus or minus sign to your answer uh, or to that step when you actually you know, do the, the rational exponent canceling. Um, and if your top value is odd, then you don't have to do that. So that's something that's very easy to forget. Um, and you really want to watch out for that there. Um, you do want to check your answers here too for extraneous solutions. Sometimes it is easier to check in the rational form, um, but you can always check if you can simplify as well. The next thing we talked about were equations in quadratic form. So these are the ones that look like they should be quadratics, but they're a little bit off. So what we do here is we do use substitution. And typically you're gonna let whatever that middle term is be your u. So using instead of um, just the variable though, be the u and use that to help you do substitution. That usually works. Um, so that's a little tip there. Just don't forget that once you solve, you do have to substitute back in at the end to actually get the true value. Now these you may or may not have to check. So they would produce extraneous solutions potentially if you have things like rational exponents, right? So if you have rationals or radicals in there, or if you're dividing by variables, we've all seen that those produce extraneous exponents, uh, ex extraneous solutions, excuse me. So anything like that, you'd have to check. Um, if you have an example though, like this one here, or even this one here that I, I skipped, but I suggest you read it in the text just to see one more example there. Um, you're still doing that substitution piece, but because you're not dealing with the rational exponents or the radicals or any variables and denominators, you don't have to worry about extraneous solutions. Um, it's still good to check, but you don't have to worry. And then the one we just wrapped up, of course, are your absolute value equations. Here, you do need to make sure your absolute value is isolated first. And once it is, assuming the other value is positive, you're going to split into two equations to solve. Um, so there is a lot here. I would probably suggest maybe making an index card for each style equation with maybe an example on it and the steps, just so that as you're going through the homework, you can take out those index cards to reference and you can help jog your memory. Okay, how do I solve this type of problem here? So our last example is an application one. So we're gonna use one of the strategies we just saw. So you can see your graph, the graph in your book on page 186 um, in your text, sorry, not your test. And it shows the average number of hours per week spent watching TV by annual income. Uh, we don't really need the graph though, but it is nice to see the visual. So I'll let you do that at home. Um, but the formula is what we need here. So the formula is H equals negative 2.3 square root of I plus 67.6, which models the weekly TV viewing time. H is in hours and I is annual income. So what annual income corresponds to 44.6 hours of uh, per week of watching TV. So I'm using my formula here. So we're looking for I, right? So we're saying, okay, what is the income when the hours are 44.6? So that's what I'm plugging in here, 44.6. Now you're gonna look at this style and say, okay, what does it fit? 
So if I start going back through my other notes, I'm going back, I'm like, okay, here's my first page. It doesn't look like a polynomial, so that doesn't work. And then when I get to the second page, I'm saying, hey, I see a radical there, right? I see radicals right there. So I'm gonna use this technique for radical equations. And my radical equation needs to be, or my radical needs to be isolated in my equation. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to isolate that radical. So the first thing I wanted to do is I'm going to bring this 67 over to the other side so I can start getting like terms together. Um, just be careful when you subtract. So it is going to be negative, but I still have to do my subtraction normally, facing in the right direction here. So I have exactly 23, so it'll be negative 23. Oops, I not X, you said X's. And then I'm gonna keep isolating that radical. So I'm gonna divide by this negative 2.3 on both sides. Now my two negatives are gonna cancel and I have 10 and then I have square root of I left. So finally I've isolated my radical. And then if you go back to that page, if you need to, the process there is to go ahead and square both sides to cancel the radical. Here I have a square root, so I'm gonna use a square. And I have I is equal to 100. So now this is our income. Um, let's go ahead and check this and see if it actually works out. So I do wanna check it because it is a radical, so you can get extraneous solutions. So I would do H equals, or I guess my H was 67, right? Or 44, excuse me. 44.6 equals negative 2.3 square root of 100 plus 67.6. Well, square root of 100 is 10. Negative 2.3 times 10 is negative 23. And if you add that together on the right-hand side, you will get 44.6. So it does check out. So our income level here is 100. And just be careful, it is in thousands of dollars. So the income would be $100,000. So people who earn around $100,000 a year watch about 44.6 hours per week um, or spend 44.6 hours per week watching TV. And again, this of course is on average. And you can look at it more in, on your own. But here, if you look at your text, you do have a nice little graph there. And you can see that as annual income increases, we're actually um, decreasing the amount of time spent watching TV. Now, one thing I will note here. So that little mark here means that they have cut the axis, right? So instead of starting at zero, they're starting at 46. This is pretty common to do because our numbers are so much higher than zero. But I will say as a mathematician, that when you have a bar graph, you really should never cut your y-axis because it distorts the change. 56 to 51 is not that big of a jump, but it looks like the bar size is almost half, like right orange is about half of the red size. So that looks like a bigger jump than it is. So I'm gonna note here that I strongly disagree with your textbook that they have cut the line on the bar graph. So this is okay to do on, on a lot of line graphs and scatter plots, but really on a bar graph, your bars should be proportional to each other based on the numbers that you see. Um, so we really shouldn't be cutting um, our values here on bar graphs for the y-axis. So like I mentioned already, it is a lot to cover in 1.6 just because there's so many different style things, um, but they're all equations that we don't always use a ton. Right, so we, we really don't, we do a lot with radicals, I will say that. Radicals and absolute values, I think we use more, uh, but rationals, at least in this level of mathematics, we don't use too, too much, right? Or substitution, we use sometimes, we use it here and there. So there are things that we want to touch on in this section so that you have seen it before and you can apply these skills, but they're not things that we need to spend a whole chapter on. So read back through, take good notes, and like I said, I would really recommend maybe doing an index card for each style um, equation that you're starting to see. Um, if you find that helpful, you can even go back and do it for the quadratics or linear equations or things like that, whatever you feel like you're getting stuck on. Um, maybe have an index card for each style, and then that way it can help jog your memory as you go through the homework.